So my name is Mari Dobson-Smith. I'm the Director of Health and Biomedical Surveys at the National Centre for Social, for Social Research. Um, so what this first session here is doing is uh, giving you an update uh, about the health surveys or surveys that cover health uh, in detail. Um, what has happened to them over the past year? What kind of developments there have been? What kind of new studies are going into the field? And these studies are either currently in the UKDS already, or they are going to get that at some point uh, over the next few years. So um, this is to give you an overview of what kind of data might be, is going to be available for an analysis and research in the future. So it's quite a long session. We start off with a bit of a longer presentation that does a whistle tour of um, the main health surveys that are in field at the moment. And then we take a kind of a deep dive into two surveys. So first, we're looking at the mental health of children and young people study, um, which uh, Tamsin also spoke about uh, in the in her keynote. And then uh, we also have another presentation about active life survey. And then we round off the session with uh, two presentations on longitudinal studies, what has been going on on the birth cohorts, and what is happening on understanding society. So the session itself is an hour uh, and an hour and a half long, and the first presentation is going to be a bit longer, the other ones are going to be shorter, and we take questions at the end uh, of, the, of each of the presentations. So I'm now, now I'm going to hand over to Suzanne. Suzanne is a senior researcher at Natsen, and she has worked on a number of health studies, including HSC and Antinous. So over to you. So today I'm going to present on um, a sort of whistle-stop tour of many of the health surveys that we run at the National Centre for Social Research. Um, some of them I work on myself, others my colleagues have kindly um, shared their, their knowledge with me. So any errors are my own, not, not theirs. So here's just a list of the studies that we'll go through today. Um, so as you can see there are quite a few of them. So. Um, it will be kind of a very brief overview of each one. And we'll look at the methods, the content, the field work, and where relevant any reports that have come out um, from those, those studies. I'm not going to talk about any findings in this presentation because there isn't enough time, um, but there are reports available. And then Natsen also carries out MHCYP, and Drita will discuss this separately um, after, after my presentation. <coughs> So first we'll talk about the health survey for England. So HSE is a nationally representative sample based on the random selection of households across England. Um, it's a health examination survey, and that means that we collect both self-reported data um, from participants, as well as physical measurements and biological data. We've collected data on HSE um, annually, and it's been running for over 30 years. Uh, and this enables us to monitor health um, trends in the health of the nation. HSE is a cross-sectional survey and it has a fresh sample of participants every year. And we try and interview approximately 8,000 adults and 2,000 child participants each year. And the study is commissioned by NHS England and it's carried out by a collaborative team um, between the National Centre for Social Research and UCL. So here's just a brief overview of some of the content in HSE. Um, so it includes core content every year and then additional content uh, that comes into some years. And these lists here aren't exhaustive, but they give an indication of some of the different topics covered in the interview and the biomedical visits. So the most recent HSE um, report on findings was on 2021 data. And we published this in two parts. So in December 2022, we published a report on adult health-related behaviours and overweight and obesity in adults. And then in May this year, we published on adult health, physical activity, social care, gambling, and loneliness and well-being. Unfortunately, we weren't able to report on children's health in 2021 um, because of the low number of children taking part as we came out of the pandemic. And the data for HSE 2021 will be available on the archive later this year. And then HSE 2022 is currently in field. Um, the field work was extended for the 2022 survey 
due to industry-wide um, fieldwork challenges. The majority of fieldwork for HC 2022 is being conducted face-to-face, -face, um, and that's true of most of the, the studies that I'll talk about today. Um, as with HSE 2021, we're going to publish the report for 2022 in two parts, um, and we're currently working on a green content for this, um, and that will be, there'll be one part that's published in spring next year and one part in summer next year. And we will be able to include a report on children's health and children's health-related behaviours using 2022 data. And then we'll move on to the Scottish Health Survey. So SHARES is a national survey of the health of the Scottish population um, and it's designed to represent people of different ages, sexes, demographic areas and backgrounds. SHARES is designed to estimate, analyse, compare and monitor um, health and health related behaviours amongst the population. It started in 1995 and has been conducted annually since 2008, so we were able to look at trends. Um, and it was commissioned by the Scottish Government and is carried out by the Scottish Centre for Social Research, ONS and academic collaborators, as listed on the slide. <coughs> and um, CHES interviews approximately 4,300 adults and 1,700 children each year. So here's a list of the core topics that are included in SHARES for 2023. And again, um, fieldwork is being conducted primarily face-to-face, -face, but there is a telephone contingency if needed. And each year on SHARES we have rotating modules. Um, so these are the modules that are in 2023. So you have the CAPI, and then there's also a self-completion that's for um, participants age 16 and over. And then finally, um, we aren't able to get a sufficiently large sample of interviews either with or about children um, as part of the core sample. So we also use a child boost sample on shares. Um, and prior to September last year, we didn't have any indication before visiting a household of whether or not there would be children there or not. Um, so we had, had to issue a larger sample um, with the assumption that around 80% of them wouldn't actually have children in them. And obviously this is not a very efficient way um, to work a sample and to get those child interviews. So in September last year, a new method was introduced where addresses were matched to the community health um, database to give us a better idea of whether or not a household had children in it. Um, it's not completely accurate as obviously people move house, um, records aren't updated, etc but it does give us a much more efficient sample. We estimate that around 34% of households don't have children in them compared to the 80% previously. And so far, this method has been working really well for the child boost. And now I'll speak about the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, or ELSA. So ELSA is a longitudinal study um, and it follows a sample in England um, who are aged 50 and over. It's been running since 2002, so last year it celebrated its 20th anniversary. The sample for ELSA is drawn from the Health Survey for England and it's refreshed periodically. The ELSA interview includes um, a kind of main CAPI interview that's conducted roughly every two years, and then there are also biomedical visits every four years. And the aim of ELSA is to collect data across health, economic and social domains. So in terms of what's currently happening on ELSA, uh, Wave 10 data collection was disrupted by COVID, but it was completed in March this year. And that was conducted by a mixture of face-to-face -face interviews and video interviews. Um, and we also included a refreshment sample in Wave 10 and that had an ethnic minority boost. We're currently working on getting wave 11 of ELSA ready to go into the field, and that will launch mm -hmm. next month. Um, and this again will be face-to-face -face visits. Wave 11 will include a nurse visit, um, a bio, so to collect biomeasures, and there is also an additional refreshment sample included in wave 11. 
And then finally, we also have um, wave two of the Healthy Cognitive Aging Project, or HCAP, is currently in field. Um, and this is a sub-study from ELSA that aims to investigate dementia risk by using a harmonised cognitive assessment protocol. And then for data delivery, there are three data deliveries expected to UKDS over the next year, um, where ELSA data will become available. Then we'll move on to the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, or APMS. So APMS is a nationwide study that's conducted roughly every seven years and has been running since 1993. It provides quality data on the prevalence and trends in mental health in England. It's commissioned by NHS England and sponsored by the Department of Health and Social Care. And it's run by NATSEN um, in collaboration with the University of Leicester. And in fields, we call APMS the National Study of Health and Wellbeing. And there's a target sample of around 8,000 interviews. So um, APMS is currently in field and we've got a two-stage design. So there is um, a survey questionnaire, an initial interview with participants, and then there's a clinical follow-up assessment that's done with just a subsample of participants. We also have two samples in field for 2023. There's the core sample, which has um, a deprived area boost included. And then we also have the representing ethnic minority groups sample. And this includes individuals from um, these ethnic backgrounds listed here. So uh, the representing ethnic minority groups sample is a key feature of the 2023 survey. Um, and the, it's, really, it's a really important part of the survey that we wanted to include to ensure that we have robust data on the mental health um, and well-being of different ethnic groups. So in previous um, studies, the random selection of addresses has meant that there hasn't been enough people taking part from, from different um, ethnic backgrounds for us to be able to look at the mental health of people in those groups in more detail. Even if we put data from a couple of survey years together, we don't have uh, a big enough sample to carry out the analysis. Um, and the last time a mental health survey focused on people from ethnic minority groups was in 2000. So there's an urgent need to update that data. And as you can see here, um, from that study, we found that common mental disorders were highest amongst Pakistani men um, in midlife and Indian and Pakistani women compared to white British groups um, of the same age and sex. And so um, with the representing ethnic minority groups sample, we'll be able to update this data um, and do more robust analysis. And then finally for APMS, here is a list of the content that's included in um, the first survey <laughs> interview. So there are CAPI questions delivered by the interviewer, and then there's also a self-completion um, that's done either by Cassie or Cowie, so, um, on a laptop or um, on the web. And that includes any of the more sensitive questions that we wouldn't have the interviewer asking participants. And now we'll move on to talk about the National Study of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, or NATSAL. So NATSAL takes place every 10 years um, since 1990. <laughs> And NATSAL 4 launched in September last year. And the purpose of NATSAL is to collect data on health, relationships, experiences, and attitudes towards topics related to sex. It informs the HPV vaccination programme, the National Chlamydia Screening Programme, as well as relationship and sex education in schools. NATSAL is funded by the Wellcome Trust, and the Economic and Social Research Council, and the National Institute for Health Research, and it's carried out by a consortium made up of um, the National Centre for Social Research, UCL, the University of Glasgow, and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So NATSAL is also in field at the moment, um, and it includes individuals aged 16 to 59 years across England, Scotland, and Wales. And this year, we're also including a young person boost of individuals aged 16 to 29. Um, and this is where interviewers are trying to select and interview people of this age in 75% of their addresses 
to ensure that they are well represented in the sample. And this will um, enable us to look at, so for example, the um, HPV vaccinations and cervical screening programs within that age group. So along with um, a series of questions about their lifestyle and attitudes, participants are asked to provide a biological sample, either a urine sample or a vaginal swab, and consent to data linkage. And for the current NATSAL um, survey year, we've actually got two samples in the field. Um, and the first is from the postcode address file, where addresses are randomly selected um, and interviewers go and visit face to face to conduct an interview. And then we also have um, the NATSEN opinion panel. So participants who have previously um, participated in the Brit British Social Attitudes Study and agreed to follow up um, contact. Interviewers have been conducting telephone interviews with them. And then there'll also be a short web follow up with any non-responders from, from the um, opinion panel. And then moving on to the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, or NDNS. So this is a cross-sectional continuous study of diet and nutrition of individuals in the UK. Um, it's in its 15th year of um, NDNS as it, as it currently is. And it's designed to be representative of the general UK population. And it provides information needed to develop and monitor public health um, and food safety. NDNS is funded by the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities and Food Standards Agency. Um, and it is conducted by a consortium um, made up of the National Centre for Social Research, the MRC Epide Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge, and then we also have our fieldwork partners, NISRA, who conduct fieldwork in Northern Ireland. So um, the most recent uh, kind of group of NDNS years are years 12 to 15, so 2019 to 2023. Um, and in, this, in these years, we moved from the previous dietary intake method, um, which was paper diaries, and we now use a web-based collection um, of dietary recalls using uh, software called Intake24. Now, Obviously, the, the years spanned the pandemic, so we used a mixture of telephone and face-to-face -face, um, data collection across years 12 to 15, um, with more face-to-face -face towards the end. And then we've also got biomedical visits where we collected um, blood samples, and then there are also spot urine samples used to measure uh, levels of iodine in the population. We finished all field work now for NDNS, the last um, biomedical visits were this week. And um, so we're preparing for the year 12 to 15 UK report and the year 10 to 15, because years 10 and 11 hasn't, haven't been reported on before, um, Northern Ireland reports. And they will be published next year with data put onto the archive shortly after. And now the adult oral health survey. So this provides up-to-date surveillance information on adult oral health status, health inequalities, oral health-related quality of life, and oral health behaviours. It's been conducted roughly every 10 years since 1968. And it's funded by the um, Office for Health Improvement and Disparities and the Department of Health and Social Care. And it's run um, by a consortium made up of NATSEN, ONS, and academic partners. As with other surveys, um, the oral health survey is currently in field for 2023, and we're using a paired visit for the first time, where interviewers and de dental examiners are going to visit households together. Um, and the interviewer will um, conduct an interview, including information like a household questionnaire, questions on health and lifestyle, um, and oral health behavior. And then the examiner will conduct a dental examination looking at the health of intraoral soft tissues, presence of dentures, tooth condition, and tooth wear. And then finally, the gambling survey of Great Britain. So the purpose of this survey is to collect data on gambling behaviors amongst adults in Great Britain. Um, and the aim of the current piece of work is to test new method methodology 
to measure gambling participation and also the prevalence of problem gambling, with the aim of replacing existing surveys carried out for the Gambling Commission. And it's commissioned by the Gambling Commission um, and carried out by us at the National Centre for Social Research in collaboration with Heather Wardle at the University of Glasgow. We're currently in the experimental statistics phase, so we've completed stakeholder engagement and a pilot study, and then also um, a year of experimental statistics looking at different methodology, so for example, different participant selection methods, and also different methods of asking um, about having spent money on gambling activities. And the study is pushed to web with the option of paper completion, um, and we're currently considering with the Gambling Commission whether we will roll out the survey. And that is the end of the whistle stop tour. <laughs>